delighted to introduce our panelists who are here with us today. In alphabetical order, uh, we have Dr. Dennis Binder, who's a professor here at Chapman University. Wait, that's Dennis Dog again. Uh, Chapman University Daily Fowler School of Law, whose nationwide law school teaching career has spanned more than four and a half decades. Do you hear me? Four and a half decades. Dennis received a BA from the University of San Francisco, a JD from the University of San Francisco School of Law, where he graduated first in his class, and an LLM and SJD degrees from the University of Michigan Law School. And his, his ringtone is the University of Michigan fight song. <laughs> Specializing, <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> Specializing in environmental law, torts, and toxic torts, Professor Binder has served as consultant to such organizations as the Army Corps of Engineers and United Farm Workers. After two decades of researching, promoting, and publishing considerable literature about dam safety, D-A-M, <laughs> Professor Binder received the National Award of Merit from the Association of State Dam Safety Officials in 1996. In his spare time, Dennis speaks and publishes extensively in areas of infrastructure, emergency action planning, and causes and responses to natural disasters. In 2018, Professor Binder published The Application of Criminal Law in Non-Terrorist Disasters and Tragedies, a 91-page list of worldwide disasters and the resulting criminal proceedings. The next panelist is Mr. Josh Blackman. Josh is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law, Houston, who specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Professor Blackman is the author of the critically acclaimed books, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, and Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. Josh was selected by Forbes Magazine for the 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy, Josh has twice testified before the House Judiciary Committee <coughs> on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration and health care. He is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Josh is also the founder and president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS. You should all play. The Internet's premier Supreme Court Fantasy League. And blogs at joshblackman.com. Josh is the author of over four dozen law review articles, and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, LA Times, and other national publications. Our third panelist is Roger Pilon. His wife, an occasional spokesperson, Juliana <laughs> Pilon, is also here today. <laughs> Roger Pilon holds the Cato Institute's B. Kenneth Simon Chair in Constitutional Studies, which he has held since it was established in 1998. He joined Cato as a senior fellow in October 1988 and until 2019 has served as director of Cato's Center for Constitutional Studies, which he founded in 1989, vice president for legal affairs, which he was named in 1999, and publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review, which he founded in 2001. Roger has received a BA from Columbia University, an MA and a PhD from the University of Chicago, and a JD from the George Washington University School of Law. Prior to joining Cato, Roger held five senior posts in the Reagan administration at the Office of Personal Management, the State Department, the Justice Department, and he was a national fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institute. In 1989, the Bicentennial Commission presented him with its Benjamin Franklin Award for Excellence in Writing on the U.S. Constitution. In 2001, Columbia University School of General Studies awarded him its Alumni Medal of Distinction. Roger lectures and debates at universities and law schools across the country and abroad, and he testifies often before Congress. His writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Legal Times, National Law Journal, Harvard Law Journal, and Public Policy, Stanford Law and Policy Review, and elsewhere. He's also appeared on NBC's Nightline, CBS 60 Minutes, Fox News Channel, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, and here today. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Richard E. Redding. <laughs> who is a professor of psychology and education and the Ronald Rotunda Distinguished Professor of Jurisprudence here at the Fowler School of Law. Richard received his Bachelor's of Arts from Hampton Sydney College, his Master's of Science from Vanderbilt University, his JD from Washington Lee University, and his PhD from the University of Virginia. Richard also recently received, served as the Vice Chancellor for Graduate Education, during which time he held the Wayne Friedkin Chair, and before that he served as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Administration at the Fowler School of Law. He previously taught at Villanova University School of Law and University of Virginia and School of Law, 
and the Department of Psychology. He specializes in forensic issues in criminal law and juvenile justice. The, issue, the use of social science research in law and public policy, legal education, and the ways in which social and political attitudes influence how science is used in policy making. Professor Redding has published close to 100 book chapters and articles in leading legal and scientific journals. He has co-authored or co-edited four books and serves on the editorial board of a number of peer-reviewed journals. His work has been cited over 4,000 times to date, and he has an amazing collection of art and artifacts from throughout the world. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. We'd like to hear your insights and reflections and experiences with Ronald Wakenda as a mentor and colleague. I'm going to suggest we go in alphabetical order for convenience, and you're welcome to come up here. So Dr. Dennis Binder, would you care to begin? Thank you, Professor Howell. Let me start by saying my tribute to Ronald Tunda is his bow tie. <laughs> and for those of you who want a photo, this will be one and only chance that you ever see me in a bow tie. <laughs> Uh, you know, life is an incredible journey. Enjoy the journey, enjoy the voyage. And Ron certainly had an incredible journey. But I want to talk to you about a colleague. You get here at 8.30 in the morning, Ron, how are you? So far, so good. <laughs> Four o'clock in the afternoon, Ron, how's it coming? So far, so good. You come in on a Saturday because you got stuff to do, Ron said, Ron, how are you? So far, so good. It was always so far so good, except when he said, thank God it's Wednesday, or, thank God it's Thursday. It was always so far so good. That was his mantra in life. And life was very good to him. Uh, but I want to begin by acknowledging his co-authors, John <clears throat> over there in, in Essex, and John Nowak in Con Law. But from this point on, I assume everything is his and not the co-authors for our purpose today. Uh, it's amazing. Three years after graduating from law school, he's the assistant majority counsel on the Watergate Committee, which Professor Hewitt mentioned. Let me take a step closer. You have a conservative working with Democrats to impeach a Republican president. <laughs> Think of the irony of that. Not today. But a few more things that came out of that. Uh, most of you have no idea how riveting Watergate was to the American people. But the Senate hearings were broadcast live throughout the country. And people would leave work, they'll leave meetings, they'll leave uh, symposia to watch the big TV screens. And one of the major players was John Dean, who had been counsel to the president. John Dean did go to jail, but he, his testimony was just riveting before it comes. It was really, it really nailed for the Nixon. But afterwards, John Dean asked this famous question. How in God's name did so many lawyers get involved in something like this? Starting with the President of the United States, the Attorney General of the United States, and a couple dozen more lawyers. Keep in mind, it was lawyers that cleaned up after those lawyers. <laughs> so it's just not one-sided. But, but John Dean, and Ronald Tunde became good friends. And they worked together afterwards on, on several projects. I mean, and that's just something about Ron, that he, did, he, was, he didn't have tunnel vision when it came to work with his people. He could, he could cross the aisle. So he's associate counsel on the Nixon Wadi. And then 25 years later, he became special counsel to Ken Stahl on the uh, Clinton investigation of a white water, which became the Monica Lewinsky investigation. But I want to tie the two together another way. It turns out that in the Watergate hearings, another young attorney was, went to work for the House Judiciary Hillary Committee, Clinton. and the Hillary. question is whether or not she was fired or not for professional irregularities. That was Hillary Clinton. So the story is out there that she's actually fired for cause. And of course, the counter story is, no, that's not true. But that's Hillary, what can I say? Uh, Did you see it? They dealt with the Wall Street Journal. He said the other day. Now, uh, I mean, he, he 
He was lucky by where he was placed at times. Watergate was an asshole when he started teaching the University of Illinois. The dean came up to him and said, there's not much out there on professional responsibility. Why don't you start doing that? So I'm going to give you two ideas of what professional responsibility was. In law school in the late 60s, we had to take a course in GR. The book, I think it was a good book, was about that thick. So it wasn't much, and it had big type in it. But there's a story, and now I'm going to give you a trigger warning. You don't want to hear this. Close your ears. And the dean's not here, thank God. Uh, I started teaching in 1972 at a very small college. It was a very small town, surrounded by wheat, corn, and soybeans in the flatlands of Ohio. And the dean had been dean for 25 years. I think he started about the end of the Civil War. He was definitely old school. He taught professional responsibility. He said, all of lawyers' problems come down to three things. Three things caused every lawyer to screw up. Fast cars, slow horses, and loose women. Now, can you imagine trying to teach that today? I don't think tenure would protect me. That was what it was like when Ron really pioneered the professional treatment of legal ethics. Yes, he was lucky to be there, but part of being lucky is seeing the opportunity and running with it. Lightning can strike a lot of people in terms of ideas, but they don't do anything. He did. The job might be doing damn safety. It was a fluke. No intention of doing it. But something came up. I wrote something suddenly. I'm speaking to engineers for three and a half decades on the legal aspects of dam safety. Going anywhere from Hawaii to Jackson Mill, West Virginia, where Stonewall Jackson grew up as a boy. You know, so anyway, you don't know, but enjoy the ride. And by the way, he may have gone to Harvard, and I may have gone to local Jesuit school, but we both ended up here. <laughs> so think of that. <laughs> so. The thing with Ron is, he loved to talk to you, but many people were intimidated by him and, uh, and were scared to approach him. I don't know how many mornings we spent a half hour, 45 minutes hour talking before class. Well, talking is a misnomer. He did most of the talking, <laughs> but I would listen, eating it up. And what would end those conversations? The phone would ring, and some conservative muckety muck from somewhere was on the phone talking to Ron, and it was over. But there's times I had to ask him for advice, and he knew it. He knew it. It's amazing what he knew. Now, this is at your table. What the heck is this? This is Astronomy Magazine in 1975 publishing photos taken by Ronald Tundra on a Minolta SRT-101, which is a great camera, of the track of Mercury across the sun. <clears throat> this is not con law. This is not the <laughs> This is not law. This is Ron. Words I could use to describe Ron, you know, you're working on something, and a word pops up that you haven't seen in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, some of you haven't been that point yet. But the word that popped up Polymath. about one's erudite. Also, and this is not totally political <clears throat> today, a modern Renaissance man. His knowledge was not limited to law, not limited to astronomy. Whatever you want to talk about, he knew. But unlike Cliff Haber in the old Cheers TV show, he wasn't pushing on you, he wasn't obnoxious. You had to bring it up, and he would talk and talk and talk. I do know there's two things I knew he didn't know, so I felt proud about that. But <laughs> it was amazing, his font of knowledge. Humor. A couple of years ago, Professor Ripken came upstairs and said, is Elon Musk in the building? <laughs> <laughs> Elon, where's Elon? I said, Susanna, oh, Susanna. <laughs> That's just Ron Rotunda's license plate, <laughs> E. Musk. <laughs> but that sums up his sense of humor as much as anything else. Uh, his bio, you talked about it. His short bio, which is single spaced on the Chapman website, was only nine pages, <laughs> only four paragraphs. It's 
awkward, <laughs> it's a long paragraph, but uh, the rest of it is, uh, this is wonderful. Tons of pages of op-eds and tons of pages of books and articles. Some people wrote he had published over 500 pieces between books, updates, treatises, porn books, op-eds, astronomy magazine. I didn't bother to count, <clears throat> but, but I think it was true that he had published that much. Now, so 29 pages of the CV for articles, newspaper columns, 14 pages of books, and, and his large articles are published almost everywhere, from Harvard all down to the lowest law school. He did not discriminate. If he had something to say and they wanted to hear it, he would write it. He, even with his Harvard degrees, he was not an elitist. And yet, I can assure you at faculty meetings, he could be the bane of deans. <laughs> because he could cut to the chase. He could cut right through to the strengths and weaknesses, and he would ask questions that nobody wanted to answer. And he could be a curmudgeon. He could be a iconoclastic. But he was never wrong in what he was asking. It doesn't mean to carry the field, but he was never wrong. It was amazing what he could do. Now, having talked to him a lot, I can tell you his views on what's happening in the country today, although he hasn't been with us for almost a year. As for President Trump, he loves the politics. He hated the messenger. And I think a lot of conservatives will say that. He really liked what the president was accomplishing. He just did not like the tweets and all the other personal baggage, baggage of the president. And he was open about it. Now, as to what's happening today, I submit to you he would be appalled at what's happening in our democracy today, but he'd love watching the circus. <laughs> <laughs> and shortly before he passed on, he was going to give a presentation to the faculty of his latest book, John Marshall and the case since that United the States of America, Beveridge's Abridged Life of John Marshall. Well, the original Beveridge was written about a century ago. It's four turgid volumes to read, but won the Pulitzer. So Ron edited it and then added his notes and comments to bring it up to date and also make it readable. But there was nothing he couldn't talk about or write about, and it was just amazing just sit back and, and listen. And let me add, yes, I went to Michigan, but I did turn down Harvard and Yale because Michigan bought me. And I'm not intimidated <laughs> talking to someone from Harvard and Yale. <laughs> and you know that. <laughs> so, yeah, they were very good to me, and they, they bought me. It was an obscene fellowship that was tax-free in 1970. And that's why I did not go to you as alma mater. So, thank you all. It was just a pleasure. And by the way, when Ron was in the hospital, I did visit him twice, but he was already, well, he was sleeping when I went to visit him. So I talked to the doctors a lot, and, and uh, yeah. Let me finally say, we lost Ron in his prime at the young age of 73. Hmm. He had never slowed down. He was still publishing. He was still grinding everything out. And he was still politically active. I'm one year away. I hope I can be that way next year. Without his fate, let me add. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> I have now been a law professor for seven years, uh, but I graduated law school not that long ago, in 2009. And in 2006, I walked into law school absolutely clueless. I had never taken a class in constitutional law, and I couldn't tell you what SCOTUS meant. 
That, clueless, that cluelessness changed when I entered Professor Rotundo's con law class at George Mason. I was hooked. Ron, as would come to know him, was able to blend seamlessly probing questions, compelling lectures, and uproarious humor. One of my favorite rotunda jokes concerned the Man Act. Now, if you don't know what the Man Act is, it makes it a crime to transport women across state lines for immoral purposes. So again, transporting girls across state lines for moral purposes, basically prostitution. So he tells this joke. A zookeeper fed his long-lived dolphin seagulls, which was a secret to the longevity. One night, he was carrying the gulls, but he had to jump over a sleeping lion. So he was arrested for transporting gulls across stayed lions <laughs> for immoral porpoises. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> the best. Even Ron's syllabus, which is all of one paragraph, was comical. So if the first day of class, read the US Constitution. For each class, please read 30 pages beyond where we finished in the previous class. If you do that, you will often be ahead, but never behind. And that was our syllabus. We never knew where the hell we were. We always had to read ahead 30 pages. It drove me nuts, but that's where it was. Now, a few weeks into the semester, I invited Ron to a federal side debate on the Ninth Amendment with, remember this, Ron? I do indeed. With Cato's Roger Blunt. I helped put that event. That was my first federal event to put together. I tried. Yeah. I haven't changed. So at first, I invited Ron to be a panelist. And Ron said he wasn't the right person. And by the way, I have all the emails with Ron saved. These are actually quotes from Ron's emails. He emailed everywhere. He says, I suppose you want someone who's a view of the Ninth Amendment more restrictive than Rogers. I'm not sure. Eventually, Nelson Lund, who was another professor at Mason, indicated he would do it. And then Ron said he would moderate. Quote, I'm a very moderate person, which itself is hilarious. <laughs> When we tried to figure out the timing, Ron joked, he said, quote, my guess is that the students like to ask questions rather than watching us talking heads, which indeed was true. Uh, the debate was a great success. It was the first event I had ever put together as a student and in inspired my involvement with the Federal Society. And I've become friends with Ron and Nelson and Roger uh, over the past decade or so. Um, Ron would email with me all the time. We heard before, he emails everyone. And unlike most law professors, he actually responds to emails from students. Uh, most professors do not. They say, come talk to me, or they'll ignore it. And uh, he always engaged with questions I sent him. I sent him lots of questions. At one point, uh, this was back in the 2000s, Bill Clinton said he could run it as Hillary's VP. Okay? I asked Ron if that was constitutional under the 22nd Amendment. As you know, you should know, the president and the vice president can't be from the same state. It's a fairly trivial rule but it's an important provision. Ron replied with his usual wit, quote, I don't think answering legal questions is Bill's forte. <laughs> oh. You may not know this, but Bill Clinton was a law professor at Arkansas, and one semester he basically lost the exams. He just lost the final exams, didn't know where they went. I don't want to know where they went, but they were gone. He added, quote, Bill and Hillary are from the same state, and the, president cannot, and the vice president cannot be from the same state, Amendment 12. Okay, there we go. I say the 22nd, I meant 12th, sorry, typo my notes. Law of Editors picked it up later. Okay. <laughs> In another email, I inquired about then candidate Rudy Giuliani's proposal to quote, bribe the states with money and power. Ron actually advised Rudy's short lived presidential campaign. Uh, he thought it was going to go big, but it wasn't so huge. Uh, Ron replied, quote, giving money to the states is okay. If there are no strings, sadly, there are always strings, and there are always strings. Uh, later in the semester, I asked him whether the Virginia GOP could require voters to sign a loyalty oath. This plan was designed for Democrats for interceding in Virginia's open primary, which they did in 2008. He quickly wrote back and pointed me to the oaths cases in the textbook. He explained, quote, there's a real free speech problem. A few days later, Ron emailed me to note that the GOP dropped the pledge. He thought that much of his students. Unprovoked, he sent me items that would interest me. Professors don't do that. Hell, I don't do that. Um, I'm, I feel ashamed. Uh, later in the semester, I missed a class in which Ron answered some question that I'd asked earlier early in the semester. For years, he would rag on me that I missed the class. And he never told me what the damn answer was because I missed the class. Um, his memory was 
remarkable. He remembered every little bit. After our constitutional law class, Ron remained a strong presence in my life. Um, during my 2L year, I asked him if he had some time to chat about clerkships at a certain time. He replied that my preferred day wouldn't work. Quote, I will have a small private lunch with the president, exclamation point. I'm excited it'll be at a Georgetown restaurant. In a follow-up email, he wrote, speaking of the president, our lunch was great. <laughs> Bush was in great form. He spoke impromptu for over an hour. We were about six feet from him the whole time. He told me that I had to obey Kendra, his wife, because she's a major and outranks me. I told him that I already knew that. Another time, he apologized for being unable to attend an event at Mason. He wrote, quote, tomorrow, I get two wisdom teeth extracted, so the next time we chat, I'll have less wisdom. <laughs> Occasionally, we even talked about the law. After Boumediene versus Bush was decided in 2008, Ron quipped, quote, Asher bin Laden, I think he would get paid based after the decision, although the case has a lot of fudge words in it. For example, Kennedy complained that people were detained for an undue amount of time with no definition of what time is due. He was giving insights in a case, and who am I? I was a former student. Shortly before D.C. v. Heller was assigned, this was a big Second Amendment case, he predicted, quote, Scalia will write the majority. Ron was right. <laughs> Hours after it was decided, Ron emailed me and said, see, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm trying to edit the case now to put it in the case book. It's too long. But there's a lot of discussion of how to interpret. I'm editing Stevens now. Again, this was a huge deal. He was on a publication deadline. And he emailed me back to say that he got it, right? And he's editing the damn case. Um, even after Ron left George Mason for Chapman, the, the Eastman steel, as it were, uh, we kept in touch. During my 3L year, when I attended a clerkship seminar at Pepperdine, which is not too far, uh, Ron and Kinder picked me up for dinner. And they picked me up in this snazzy Mercedes coupe and took me to, uh, to a very nice restaurant. Um, Ron joked about his car. He had some car troubles. Uh, there was a loose flux capacitor or something like that. They put in a new one. So we always went back to the future. After I started teaching, uh, Ron and I grew closer. I would send him copies of my articles, and he always sent me back pithy comments. Uh, the last project that we collaborated on was on ABA Rule 8.4G, which you heard about this morning from, from my friend Jack Park, uh, which concerns this, this basically a speech code the ABA is seeking to impose on the states. Uh, and Ron sent me excellent comments, and he largely agreed with me. So if I knew that the king of ethics says you're on the right track, I knew it's a good article. Um, Ron not only affected my scholarship, but he also made a significant impact on my teaching. Many of the specific points I make in con law come directly from Ron. This, you, you're gonna sound nuts, but I remember the specific points he would make in class at the exact juncture he made them. Teachers don't do that, but Ron left that mark on me. Uh, for example, he would always complain that most con law case books excluded Justice Blackman's citation in Roe v. Wade. Justice Blackman cited a famous case called Buck v. Bell. That case upheld mandatory sterilization for imbeciles. And Ron always complained that most casebook editors who are quite liberal would exclude that deliberately. He wrote an email, quote, they excised it from the opinion, I guess. They wanted Blackman, no relation, and the court to look better than they really are. Ron said of the editors, that's what acolytes do. He did not mince his words. And indeed, Ron had a fascinating discussion with Justice Blackman about Roe. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, I am now an editor in a con law case book with Randy Barnett at Georgetown. And I added that citation to Buck in our excerpt of Roe v. Wade so students know it. You know, Ron's not here, but his memories do live on. Uh, Ron would always send copies of his writings. And the subject line was always the same. It says, hot off the presses. You'd always send us hot off the presses. There's no press. We don't have paper. But so it was hot off the presses. And his writings were always punchy. In 2015, he emailed me at the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. This was about the bakers who didn't want to make a cake for, for a same-sex wedding. <laughs> Ron offered the definition of a, of a liberal. He's defined a liberal. You're not going to like this one, half the room. <laughs> a liberal is someone who doesn't care what you do as long as it's compulsory. Someone who doesn't care what you do as long as it's compulsory. There it is. I knew half the room would not like it. 
In 2016, I spoke at a symposium with Ron at Florida International University on the separation of powers. Uh, it was an honor. I was in the same program as Ron and David Bernstein, who's my other Conla professor. By the way, do you know what grade Ron gave me in Conla? B plus. He gave me a B plus in Conla. I never let him live that one down. But it was a, it was a multiple choice exam. Top to my hate multiple choice. But anyway, B plus. Thank you, Rotunda. It was my lowest grades in law school, by the way. <laughs> but I, I wore that with pride. And at this symposium, I told Ron, um, so much of what I do comes from your class. And I remember Ron being a little bit touched by that. I don't know if any of other, his former students being professors, I, maybe they have, I don't know. But I remember he was very touched by that. Uh, I don't think I'd be the professor I am today if it wasn't for Ron. Um, I want to close on a point that Hugh alluded before. Um, we don't know what our impact will be in life. We, we just, we can't know what our biggest influence will be. And a couple years ago, I, I went to a, a speech by Justice Scalia. He was talking to law professors. And he asked a question. He said, what's the biggest impact law professors have? Your books? No. no. Your law review articles? God, no. Right? Your op-eds? Probably not. Um, the biggest impact that any law professor has is his students. Um, they're yours for you know, four months at a time, twice a week for two hours, they are locked in your classroom. They, well, they can, I guess they can leave if they want to, but they're yours. And the things they tell you, you remember. I've only been teaching a short time, and already I've students say, Professor Black, remember when you taught me this class, you know, six years ago you made this point? This came up in a case I was working on, right? You will be amazed. You can't think of it day to day, but the impact the professors have, everyone at Chapman, on how you go about your life, how you think about questions, it will stay with you for your entire career. Um, so though Ron is gone, and, and we remember him fondly, um, his memory lives on in his students. Um, you're all here, you're students of Ron. He's had thousands and thousands of students. He's had millions of people who were students never set foot in his class. They read his books, they read his editorials in the journal, they saw him on TV. Um, and they keep his memory alive. And that is largely why he will be remembered. Uh, he cared deeply about the rule of law. He traveled around the world to different republics, trying to build their governance up to emulate our more perfect union. And I hope we can all keep Ron's memory alive and do the same. Thank you all so much. Josh opened his remarks by saying he entered Ron's class clueless having followed the career, the young career of Josh Blackman, and find it hard to believe that he was ever famous. Um, if it is true, then it is an incredible credit to Ron that he made Josh <laughs> not clueless In any event, I want to begin by thanking uh, Kylie and Amy and their staff for putting this program together. I think they have done a marvelous job, and I think we owe them a round of applause. <laughs> it is a great credit to Ron's uh, memory that uh, they have sought to do this, and so I commend them for that. Um, we, um, I also want to commend uh, those who put together the, um, the uh, video that we saw earlier uh, because that gives me an opportunity to point to an issue that was raised early in the day that uh, Ron was um, an early adopter of technology. Well, I remember his first appearance at Cato in which he used PowerPoint uh, in its very early stages. And I, it was from that that we at the Center for Constitution and Studies uh, declared PowerPoint thereafter to be unconstitutional and therefore <laughs> to be out of order in any programs that we did. And I think that uh, Ron uh, learned uh, very much from that. But in any event, um, I'm going to focus my remarks mainly on the year 2000 because that was the year that uh, Ron spent outside the normal academic world, which was his milieu for most of his career, uh, as a visiting senior fellow in constitutional studies at Cato, uh, and as the founder and director of Cato's Center for Constitutional Studies, uh, I was his supervisor, so to speak. Um, I say so to speak because you can imagine what fun that must have been. And to explain <laughs> it just a little more fully, 
you must understand the difference between the uh, world of think tanks and uh, the academic world. In the academic world, we uh, like to believe that it is the domain uh, whereby we have robust debates of welcoming all sides. I overstate the matter uh, by a lot, of course, not by a little. But in any event, that is the idea. Uh, in the think tank world in Washington, especially those think tanks that are ideologically oriented, and most are to one degree or another, the Cato Institute is a classical liberal or libertarian think tank, the Heritage Foundation is conservative, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, Center for a Progressive, what is it, Center for per whatever it's American called. Progress. Uh, what? I think it's American progress. Yep, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, is progressive, <laughs> is progressive, and so on. And so, the idea is that we do try to change the climate of ideas within a certain range. And there is, it's understood sort of implicitly, and if not understood implicitly, is made to be understood explicitly that there are some subjects that you really, that are really not, or positions that are really not consistent with the mission of the Institute. And so when Ron came on board, we were of course thrilled by the idea that um, he would be interested in joining us as so, so distinguished a professor as he. Um, but we wondered, is he going to be a problem uh, in the <laughs> sense that uh, I just sort of uh, outlined? And it turned out that he was not a problem at all. On the other hand, he was an absolutely, uh, uh, he was a godsend, and I will say more about that in just a few minutes. But he was a character. There's no question about that. And that was clear to me from the first time I met him in the early uh, 1990s um, after the University of Illinois Federalist Society invited me to speak there. Um, and uh, I'd never been to Champaign-Urbana, uh, the uh, city that uh, has, um, the only city in America that is twice misnamed <laughs> as uh, at least one professor who taught there has uh, reminded me. So when I got a call from Ron, uh, the chapter's advisor, saying he wanted to pick me up at the airport, I happily accepted, not knowing my way around the town. And as I was waiting there on the curb uh, outside the airport, there comes this uh, classic Rolls Royce uh, yep. from the 50s. Uh, he did things in style. And we arrived at the law school in style, and it was just great fun. As I said, he was a character. Uh, it was shortly thereafter uh, that he made his first appearance at Cato in December 1993 uh, to speak at our day-long conference on the politics and law of term limits. Uh, not surprisingly, the focus of his talk, uh, defending the uh, then growing movement for congressional term limits, was on constitutional issues surrounding the proposal. Uh, but before unveiling those arguments, he seemed to delight in noting that there was greater turnover in the House of Lords and in the Soviet Politburo than there was in our own House of Representatives. We published those proceedings shortly thereafter, so Ron's arguments uh, live on in that book. Um, but let me move up to 2000, which was, again, the year that he spent with us. Uh, and that's when we got to know him um, so much better. Uh, if you look at his uh, uh, curriculum vitae, you'll see that it appears that we caught him um, when, at a point in his life when he was in transition, uh, after roughly a quarter of a century teaching at the University of Illinois, uh, with uh, occasional distinguished appointments abroad and appointments in, uh, in Washington, uh, he took a visiting <coughs> appointment in 1999 at the University of Alabama. Then he came to Washington uh, for a year, uh, after which he settled uh, for several years across the Potomac at George, Washington, uh, George uh, Mason, and then um, it came out here in 2008 to Chapman. Um, perhaps it was the siren song of Washington that brought him back where his career had begun, uh, but whatever it was, his year with us was mercifully free of teaching, to say nothing of grading exams, and he made the most of it, and so did we. Uh, one of the first things he did was join the staid old Cosmos Club, yeah. uh, but he was still the colorful Ron. Apparently, uh, he had sold his Rolls Royce because he uh, drove into the Cato uh, garage every morning in a brand new red Mercedes convertible. Um, and uh, the collection of bow ties and matching pocket handkerchiefs that we heard about uh, several times during uh, this uh, program 
um, was, it seemed to be endless to us. In fact, we watched him on TV one time. Uh, he did a lot of TV and radio when he was with us. Uh, and after the commercial break, uh, there he came on the screen with a different bow tie. <laughs> During the commercial break, he had changed ties. He didn't want to, uh, uh, to uh, be a stale figure on the TV. And so that's the kind of guy he was. Um, well, let me uh, get to a bit more serious, and that was not always easy to be with Ron. Um, the, um, uh, I don't recall precisely when he came on board. Our digital records uh, don't go that far back, and the, the paper records are uh, no longer readily available. Uh, but uh, the record does show that on September 17, 1999, Constitution Day, uh, he spoke at our forum entitled, The Court Rediscovers Federalism. Uh, he was joined in that forum by Lyle Denniston, uh, one of the longtime Supreme Court correspondent for the Baltimore Sun, and the acknowledged dean of the Supreme Court reporters. The two discussed the history of the court's federalism jurisprudence and some of the implications of its recent uh, federalism jurisprudence. In a moment, I'm going to turn more fully to that subject, but uh, to the confluence of federalism, the Commerce Clause, and the doctrine of enumerated powers, which was central to our work at the uh, center, uh, and to Ron's contribution to that. But first, let me briefly uh, review some of the other things he did when he was with us, uh, now that uh, he was back in Washington, Malmstrom, and back in the seat of power and in an open presidential season uh, to boot. As I mentioned a moment ago, freed from the usual academic duties and back in, his political in this political environment, uh, he seemed to thrive. Uh, not that he hasn't always had one foot in academia and, others, and the other in the real world, as we in the in-between think tank world are fond of putting it, as we've heard from others uh, today. But um, with Cato's public affairs shop behind him, he had many more opportunities for TV, radio, op-eds, magazine articles, and he sees them all. Now, let me mention just a few such to give you a sense of the range of his interests. Early on, for example, uh, he wrote on religious displays in public forums, on class actions in state courts, on school vouchers, on the constitutional implications of the pending Media Violence Labeling Act of 2000, and he wrote uh, a foreign policy briefing paper for us on the constitutional problems the Clinton administration faced in its proposal for enforcing the 1972 Biological Toxins and Weapons Convention. His, the range of his interests was truly um, encyclopedic. Um, soon after he arrived, he wrote also in the Wall Street Journal about the Clinton presidency's effect on the integrity of the federal courts. In fact, on that subject, he had already spoken at our 1999 conference on the rule of law in the wake of Clinton, the proceedings of which we published uh, as the administration's final year was just beginning. In part five of the book, The Guardians of Law Fail, Ron's chapter took a critical look at the role of the bar and legal academy in that failure. Um, maybe some of you in this law school took it on the chin for that, but uh, he was uh, a no-holds-barred guy on that subject. Um, it should surprise no one, therefore, that 11 months later, as the Florida long count was getting underway to determine whether it would be Bush or Gore as our next president, Ron was all over that subject. Uh, remember the hanging chads uh, during the TV uh, appearances periodically? Um, Ron, um, on November 13th, he uh, wrote an innocently enough uh, titled uh, blog post at Cato called uh, How the uh, Electoral College Works and Why It Works Well. But as interests and passions overtook principles and reason, Ron slowly took off the gloves. First with a political post, uh, excuse me, with a post entitled The Equal Protection Clause, A Field Day for Misleading Statistics. Then with the USA Today op-ed, Let the Legislature Decide. Then another Cato post, The Problem with Hand Counting. And finally, on November 23rd, the prob uh, the, um, again at our website, a mischievously titled item, Using the Psychic Hotline to Decide Contested Elections. <laughs> he had a way with words. Um, but it wasn't all fun and games. As we know, Ron had a serious side as well. 
and it came out especially in the amicus brief program we'd begun only that year, uh, only the year before uh, he joined us. Uh, thus, uh, his experience and counsel were invaluable in those early stages of the program that in the years since has become one of our most important and respected undertakings. Among the early briefs Ron helped us with was one we filed in October 2000 in Brown, later Whitman, the American Trucking Association, an as-applied challenge to a section of the Clean Air Act in which we raised, among other things, the non-delegation doctrine. We've never been reluctant to tilt at windmills. Um, and in January 1, 2001, uh, he helped us with a brief in Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where he joined with the Institute for Justice to join, uh, to argue uh, that the Corps' expansion of its jurisprudence over so-called prairie potholes pursuant to the Clean Water Act amounted to an overextension of Congress' authority under the Commerce Clause. Um, with that brief overview then, um, and some of what Ron did when he was with us, let me conclude with uh, an issue I mentioned earlier uh, one uh, central issue in federalism, the Commerce Clause, and the Doctrine of Enumerated Powers, and where Ron's involvement in that work was especially important for us. I'm going to focus on a single decision the court handed down in 2000. This seems to me has received too little attention. Uh, the case is Dewey Jones v. U.S., and it was a challenge to the federal uh, residential, uh, uh, residential arson statute the idea being that um, uh, this Dewey Jones had thrown a, a cocktail, uh, a Molokov cocktail into a house, and he was prosecuted under the federal statute. Uh, the allegation being, or the, the claim being, that uh, the jurisdiction was due to the, uh, to the uh, Commerce Clause because the um, house received its in, uh, gas and oil from out-of-state concerns, and it was insured by a company whose home office was out-of-state. Well, Ron would, not surprisingly, have nothing of this, after, especially after the Lopez decision. And so I wrote the initial uh, brief in that case, and I'll come back to, to, to Ron's role uh, in, shortly, but I need to put it in context. Um, um, as you law students all know, especially if you took your con law from Ron or from John Eastman, um, the issue of the, of the Congress's limited powers under the Commerce Clause has been a hot issue in Washington since 1995. The reason being that a case called United States v. Lopez in that year had for the first time in 58 years told Congress that its power to regulate interstate commerce was not a power to regulate anything and everything under the sun. This was a challenge to the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990, uh, in which a student in uh, San Antonio had brought a gun to school. Uh, he was caught. Uh, he was prosecuted under this federal statute because it gave a greater sentencing uh, uh, range. And when the case hit the Fifth Circuit, uh, it was argued by a public defender, some kid, not uh, a white shoe Philadelphia firm never would have raised the Commerce Clause in a context like this. This kid didn't, maybe he was a student of Ron uh, Rotunda for all I know. In any event, he did raise it, and old Judge Garwood said, wait, that's, that's right, I haven't heard that argument in 58 years. And so he found, found against the government. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, that's the case we've been looking for, because that was the centerpiece of our work at the center. So I called up Instapundent, uh, Glenn Harlan Reynolds. We weren't doing briefs at the time, and I said, can you do a policy analysis for it? For us, And he did, and he sent it up to us, and I read it, it was great, but it needed some beefing up, and it needed a good title, which I slapped on it, called Kids, Guns, and the Commerce Clause, is the Court Ready for Constitutional Government? I thought that might catch their attention. We, uh, we rifled that in to all the clerks on the court, and the, uh, the justices, of course, and then six weeks later, in oral argument, I was there, and I swear they could have been argued right, arguing right from that policy analysis. Um, in fact, I will I'll give you a little um, um, example of the colloquy. Uh, first, I have to say this. After the decision came down, 
It awakened Washington from its dogmatic slumbers, to um, paraphrase Immanuel Kant. Uh, in fact, the Washington Post asked me to do it, a, an op-ed in their Sunday section, uh, which, which they titled, It's Not About Guns. And it wasn't. It was about congression, the scope of congressional power. Guns just happened to be the subject. In any event, um, uh, the professoriate was horrified, uh, generally, about this decision. Because um, what? Congress can't regulate anything? This is, this is the new, what was the New Deal all about? And so um, uh, when this came out, they started article after article appeared in law reviews, paring it back to the point almost that it stood for the proposition that uh, Congress uh, uh, has the power to regulate guns at schools in San Antonio brought there by people named Lopez. Well, of course, I overstated, but not by much. But that was the context in which this Dewey uh, Jones case came up five years later. And so the colloquy in the early, uh, in the Lopez case was, was uh, here I'm going to paraphrase, uh, Justice um, uh, uh, Drew Days, Solicitor General Drew, Day, Drew Days, was arguing the case for the government. And he opened by saying, Congress's power under the Commerce Clause is plenary. And what, said uh, Justice Kennedy, uh, and he it just pressed him, is, is, is that mean Congress can regulate anything? Well, uh, 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 Your Honor, that's pretty much the jurisprudence you've given us. And he was absolutely right. That's, that's the way it stood at that point in time. Well, fast forward to five years, and now we have uh, the uh, argument in uh, the Jones case. And it was Deputy uh, the Solicitor General Draben who was arguing that case. And um, he, he began his argument, and Scalia jumps in. And he says, well, give me an example of something that the Congress uh, uh, can't regulate. Draben couldn't come up with it. Just give me one. Just give me one example. Draben couldn't come up with anything. Finally, Rehnquist leans over. How about guns at school? Oh, yes, yes. That's, <laughs> that's, the, thing that, that's the thing they can't regulate. And so this was the context in which uh, this uh, case was uh, coming up. And when it did, we, um, we, were, we were just thrilled by it. And as I said, I wrote the initial brief. And then the, what we were wondering, and this was early in, his, in Ron's tenure at Cato, I said, is he going to, this distinguished professor who has a reputation a mile long, is he going to say, oh, no, look, we can't, this is a little too far because we took a radical view. I mean, we went right back to, federal, to Federalist 42 where Madison told him exactly what the, Fed, the Commerce Clause was about. It was about limiting Congress to limiting the states for their interference with free. It was a, essentially a free trade uh, a power in Congress to negate states' powers and do a few other things of affirmative sort that would ensure the free flow of goods and services among the states. Well, Ron looked at that. Not only did he come on board, he was the counsel of record. He beefed up the uh, brief, added cases that hadn't occurred to us, and so we sent it in. Now, obviously, the court did not buy our full argument, but it was a unanimous opinion against the government. And so I leave you with that as a good example of the kind of thing that Ron did. He really did help us to see issues in a much more sophisticated way than we had uh, up to that point done. And we were just thrilled to have him with us. And so I will just conclude by saying uh, we will not have a, his like again for quite some time. He will be sorely missed, but we have the record. He left us, in fact, with his five-volume treatise on the Constitution, to which we have turned more than once. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I um, always had the highest admiration for Ron Rotunda. But I have to say that admiration went up a notch this morning as I spent 10 minutes, then 15 minutes, 20 minutes tying, trying to tie a damn bow tie. <laughs> After half an hour, I finally gave up. So I'm sans bow tie this, this afternoon. <laughs> But you heard Professor Heller say how he would get in every morning at 6.30. And I actually think some mornings it was 6 or maybe even 5.30. Just think, he had to tie the bow tie before he came in. 
as I was reflecting on the impact that Ron has had on my life, I realized something that um, I don't think I ever told anybody, and I'm, I'm, I'm sad now that I never mentioned it to Ron. But I think Ron was actually responsible for me coming to Chapman. I, um, uh, back in 2008, I was happily ensconced on the East Coast while teaching. I was teaching in at Villanova University, and before that, had taught at the University of Virginia. And um, you have to understand, the winters on, in Virginia or Pennsylvania, they're mild, but they're long. They last forever, at least that's what it felt like to me, as compared to winters in Boston or New York City, which are long and not so mild. And so I was itching to come out west. Uh, I'd always um, been attracted to Southern California, so I heard that a position was opening up in my area at Chapman Law School. I applied. I was offered the position. Uh, John Eastman was dean at the time. And this was back in 2008. Chapman Law School wasn't as well known or didn't have the reputation that it has today. And so I didn't know much about Chapman Law School. And my colleagues at Villanova um, Law School didn't know a whole lot about it either. And I was talking to them about, you know, should I take this position or not, and so on and so forth. And I, it was close to the time when I, I had to give Chapman a decision. You know, it was just a couple days before. And one of my colleagues who I'd been discussing this with, you know, should I go to Chapman? Should I not go to Chapman? Um, he was one of these um, people that we have in the legal academy. He always had his ear to the ground of what was going on in other law schools. Kind of, you know, we have gossips in the legal academy, just like you have every place else, right? He always knew everything that was going on. He comes running into my office. He goes, guess who I heard is going to Chapman? I said, he goes, Ron Rotunda. And he said, I think you should go. If Ron Rotunda is going there, <laughs> It's probably a pretty damn good place to be, okay? And I actually think that's what made my decision for me. Um, and I didn't really think about it until I was, again, until I, you know, I was, I was preparing my remarks for, um, for this symposium. And so I decided, I accepted the offer. I get to Chapman, 2008, and as would fate would have it, first day I'm here, I'm unpacking stuff in my office, Guess who was in the office next to me? It was also his first day unpacking his stuff, Ron Rotunda. <laughs> and a couple things I noticed immediately about Ron, obviously the bow tie. Um, another thing is that, you know, here is this giant in the law. Uh, his area of, of especially wasn't mine. I work in totally different areas than PR con law, but everybody in the legal academy knows Ron Rotunda. Um, and so he was just unpacking his books, putting them on the shelves. You know, he wasn't running down the hall like a lot of academic big shot prima donnas would be saying, get me a faculty assistant to unpack my boxes. You know, I'm not doing this. You know, he was just very humbly, this giant in the law sitting, unpacking the books, his boxes. He introduced himself to me. He wanted to know about me and so forth. And so what immediately struck me about him was the bow tie and just how humble and friendly he was. And, and so forth. And so um, geography is fate uh, a lot of times in life. And so the geography of our offices being side by side meant that we got to know each other well over the years. Um, I would go over to his home frequently for drinks or dinner. And in fact, one of the things I always remember when I, I'd go over to his house during the weekday and, and he would have a way of, of, of signaling that the evening was coming to an end when he would say, well, we have to wrap it up. It's a school, uh, uh, tomorrow's a school day, you know? And of course, that didn't mean that it's because he had to be in at 8 o'clock to teach a class, because that's not when his class was. It's no, he had to be in at 6.30 to be working on his, his research and so forth. So as I said, I got to know him pretty well over the years, and I think we became really good friends, and I really value that friendship. I um, value it so much. And the kinds of things that that stick out in my mind about Ron as a person is a lot of what you've already heard from the other speakers today. His uh, razor sharp intellect and wit. Um, he was incredibly well read as, as a number of people have remarked today. He really was a renaissance man. He could talk to you about anything when I'd go over to his house for dinner. I don't care what subject would go up, come up, he could talk about it. He could talk about it. Um, 
not just superficially, but in detail and in depth and with breadth and so forth. Um, he was a character. Anybody that um, knew Ron, you know what I mean when I say that. He was a character. Um, he liked things like country music. Who would have thought? Um, he, um, you know, he could be um, uh, a bit prickly at times. He could be irascible at times. Uh, he could even be a bit difficult at times uh, in his personality. Um, he really was the bane of many a, a dean. <laughs> Um, but, but behind that kind of sometimes um, uh, uh, personality where he, he, he um, was not shy about expressing his opinions, he was not shy about challenging authority, he really had a heart of gold and he really was a sweetheart and a sentimentalist. Um, and I'll just give you one example of that. Um, uh, a couple years ago, he was um, thinking about um, adopting a child, and he wanted to adopt a special needs child. Um, and he talked to me about it a couple times, and um, he was thinking of, of adopting a, a child in a wheelchair. And um, I remember he would just tear up talking about um, how nice it would be to be of help to this child. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of man that, um, that Ron was. Um, he didn't censor his opinions, as I said. He, he tended to wear his heart on his sleeve in terms of he told you what he thought. Um, and he wasn't afraid of, um, of expressing those opinions. He wasn't afraid of challenging authority. He wasn't um, concerned about political correctness or any of those kinds of issues. He was an incredibly hard worker, um, 6.30 or 6 every morning, every day. Um, until late at night. And the reason I'm mentioning these things is because I think um, a lot of these same personal traits are what made him so successful as a lawyer and as a law professor. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Before I do, I just want to mention a few things about his career. And um, as was mentioned, Hugh Hewitt gave a fantastic talk. Uh, but I do want to correct one thing that, that he told you about his career. I want to add a caveat to it. Um, he mentioned his CV, which is, it is 55 pages. You go to the last page, it's page 55. It's not really 55 pages. It's really more like 100 pages. And the reason I say that is because I've seen a lot of academic CVs in my life. What a lot of professors will do, you know, everything is a line and then space and then a line and then space. No, he has crammed into <laughs> one paragraph here at the bottom what in a lot of people would be a full page or two or three pages. So it's really not a 55-page CV. It's really um, much longer than that. The breadth, depth, and quality of his scholarship is amazing. Um, it was, we've already, it was already been talked about the, his service activities, so I'm, I won't go through that. One thing I did want to mention, I don't think was mentioned, that he advised several foreign governments on drafting their constitutions. So the government of Cambodia, Moldova, uh, and others. Uh, he drafted, get this, he drafted the professional responsibility rules for the Czech Republic. So the Czech Republic is, now has a set of PR rules uh, drafted in large part by Ron Rotunda. Um, most recently, his service here in California, he was a commissioner on the Fair Political Practices Commission, uh, visiting professor at, at several foreign universities. Um, give you a sampling of, of the breadth of things that he wrote about. Uh, a book, Six Justices on Civil Rights. Another book, The Politics of Language. Law Review Articles. Uh, commercial Speech in the First Amendment presidential nominating commissions, and one on lawyer jokes. He loved lawyer jokes. But the, the measure of the impact somebody has as a scholar really isn't how much scholarship they've done. You can do a lot of scholarship, and if it's, if it's not very good, so what? It's really what's the impact of that scholarship. We've been talking today about what that impact is, but there have actually been done over the years studies of the impact of various legal scholars. And so in one of these studies, um, Ron Rotunda was identified as the 11th most cited law professor. Other studies on most uh, law, uh, law professors most cited by judges, 
uh, law professors who have written the most influential legal treatises, uh, most influential constitutional law scholars. You'll find Ron Rotunda all near the top of those lists. So what lessons um, can um, those of us in the legal profession, especially those of us who are involved in doing legal scholarship, legal uh, law professors, learn from Ron? As I said, I think um, his personality traits um, were helpful to him in becoming a successful law professor. So first, as I said, he was very broadly and well educated and read. And it's been my own experience, and I've seen this in other scholars, that you often get the best ideas for scholarship, and you um, develop those ideas the best if you can bring in ideas from other disciplines, ideas from things that, you know, the best ideas often come from applying an idea from a totally different domain to the domain at hand. And I'll, if you'll um, pardon me a personal example of that, I'm a psychologist. I wear two hats, one as a lawyer, another as a psychologist. And the work I do in psychology is um, a lot of different things, nothing to do with the topic I'm about to tell you about. Um, but this is an example of the value of being well-read. I like to go to Barnes & Noble a lot. I stroll through the, the bookshelves on topics that I have no interest in, just kind of to see. One day I was looking in the self-help section. I have no interest in self-help books. I don't read self-help books. As a psychologist, I don't care about self-help books. But I was looking through these self-help books, and it, it dawned on me and said, I wonder if anybody's ever tested the efficacy of these. Like, are they effective in actually helping people? You know? And are they consistent with what people are saying in the self-help books with what we know as psychologists? And I did a study, and it became a very uh, widely cited study and so forth. That's the kind of thing that Ron would do all the time, except much more extensively, much more capably uh, than I ever could do. But being well-read is incredibly helpful. Don't be scared to voice your opinions. Don't be scared to challenge the status quo. Um, be tough when you need to be, but do it with a good heart. Work hard. And above it all, it can't hurt to wear a bow tie, even though I can't successfully <clears throat> seem to do it. Um, we'll all deeply miss Ron Rotunda uh, as a friend and as a colleague. Uh, our profession has lost a uh, true giant in, in the law and in the legal profession. Um, but if you, as you've heard just a small sampling of here today, his legacy will live on in, in so many ways and for so many years to come. Thanks. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you too can have a bow tie. That's what I should have done. A non tie. Exactly. One you don't have to All tie. You do exactly. Find the hook. <laughs> okay. Ron would never do that. It's, it's not working. It's, it's not working. That's not how you do it. No, that's not it. So even these aren't so <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. It was really wonderful. It was a really fabulous tribute. And I'm sure Ron would just be so choked up to hear this. It was great. Ron had such a wealth of knowledge. Um, and often people with a wealth of knowledge and a lot of areas of interest really have difficulty talking to people who don't. Um, I never felt that was true of Ron. I am one who doesn't. I would talk to him about a variety of things, and then occasionally he would come in with something, and you've all picked up on various areas of knowledge. Who knew? Once I was talking to him, and he said, well, I have to go now. I have to give my TEDx talk <laughs> on the Constitution, ethics. No, no on the cloud and how the crowd is the best way to answer some questions. Okay, so I went. <laughs> of course I went. It was at Soka University, not far from here. I took a tape of it because I couldn't believe he was doing it. He had PowerPoints. He had videos. He had analysis. He had charts and graphs. The point being, if you have an unanswerable question, send it out to the universe. And all these people coming together, and then he showed a how questions had been answered, you know, the bell curves, and these amazing questions. They were right when they all got together. What? Where'd that come from? When did you do this? You can't be doing it at 6 AM. Just one example of many, many things. And, and I think that that translated into his teaching students as well. 
it's, it's difficult to teach. It's difficult to teach something that you know really, really well and break it down. I have a, I have a brother-in-law who's a big deal mathematician. I said, well, string theory. He said, nope, <laughs> I can't explain it. I'm not going to do that. I can't break it down. I can't work with you. But I don't think that was true when working with students. One of his students uh, spoke at his memorial at the Faith Interface Center, um, and, and he, he was so articulate about how patient Ron was with him. I'd come in with my research, and, Ron, and you know what Ron must be thinking. He would patiently explain how to make this better. He and I'd go out and do it again. So he would patiently explain how to make it better. I would write, imagine writing and giving it to Ron. He would write something, and Ron would work with him on it, not just throw it at him. He would work with him on it, edit it, go away and come back, go away and come back. And the, the student was so grateful that he took the time with him. I know he felt that way about all of the students. He really did. We talked one time about the about student evaluations. Some people read them, faculty read them. Not all faculty, but some of us read them. And I said to him, what was the, what was the most one you couldn't work with? What was one that just came out of the blue? He said, one student wrote, he's too short. <laughs> I'm going to prove that. I'm going to work on that. And he told his students, I, may, some of you may have had him. He said, before they do their evaluations, he, he, he says this to them. I shouldn't give it away. I should just take it and use it. He said, well, do you remember when you were young and your mother would say to you, you don't have something nice to say about someone. Don't say anything at all. Well, if you don't say anything, I'll know what you mean. <laughs> Aren't my feelings. So I'd, I'd like to sort of open this to questions in the audience. Is there any questions or anything you'd like to say about Ron or anything you'd like to discuss with the panelists? Um, we have just a few minutes left. Anybody out there have a Yes, sir. Josh is a student. Did he finish the material? No, 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 no. And he would frequently start a case in one class, and then the next class just forget about it and move on to something totally different. It drove, it drove us nuts. Or he would randomly come back to case like weeks later. Uh, we were totally, but everything was was by plan. He had a he, he had a way of going about teaching that was remarkable. By the way, his lecture notes. You ever his lecture notes? There were these tattered old yellow pieces of paper in these plastic sleeves to save them. And I swear, they must have been 30 years old. And he would just add new sleeves of paper every now and then. But he would just read them. And he just had everything on his lecture notes. It was remarkable. And funny, too. Yeah. And the jokes The, the jokes were in there. And he <laughs> punchline to the point. Yeah. They were always, <laughs> the jokes were always there. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, as a comment, he, he had a class on, on Monday morning at, at 8.30. I think it was 8.30. And you know, he's been teaching these classes for decades. But all day Sunday, he'd be at the computer preparing for the class. Yeah. I'd be reading his paper, I'd be relaxing, I'd be watching television, I'd be reading whatever. He would be preparing for his class, the same class he taught for decades. He, he never took anything for granted. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the students very much. And I think that's a great impact he's going to have. All of those students, every one of them is out there with his ethical teachings and with his constitutional teachings and his attitude toward life and his attitude toward them, I think you take with you. I know I will. I miss him a great deal. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming and your thank time. You. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you. Great. Is this this camera that's We're going to have one more 15-minute break, and then we'll get started with our final panel today on constitutional law. I like the circles.